The story of Russia is in two parts. One, the Russia of the Tsars. The other, Russia under the Soviets. In each regime, a story of tyranny and harsh, despotic rule. Peter the Great, innovator and builder, was also a tyrant and a despot. Earlier, there were harsh rulers like Ivan the Terrible, who executed his own son. This was old Russia. Here, Nicholas II, Tsar of all the Russias, was taking part with his family in formal ceremonies in the Kremlin. Ceremony symbolic of imperial tradition. was all-powerful. His most loyal bodyguards, the Cossacks, once the fiercest rebels against imperial authority. Then as now, Russia offered a fine life to the few and a bleak, monotonous existence to the many. Most of them were illiterate peasants, like these workers at Astrakhan on the river Volga. Industry, although growing, was limited, and the economy was basically agricultural. By Western standards, the people were poor and uneducated. Yet these old documentary films, showing actual living conditions under the Tsar, are not shown today in the Soviet Union. Tsarist Russia is gone, and soon only people in homes for the aged will really remember those earlier times. dominating force in Tsarist Russia has survived over 40 years of attack by a government dedicated to atheism. Countless churches have been closed, but many millions of people, as in the village of Kazarovichi in the Ukraine, are still strong in their faith. They have the courage to attend church, to believe in God. In Samarkand, in Central Asia, is the great mosque and teaching center for the Muslim world, known as the Registan. It was begun by Tamerlane in the year 1400. Today it is a museum. Nearby, however, Muslims still pray in a little mosque, 
despite the hardships imposed upon them. A man's basic need to worship God is not the only vestige of the old empire to confound its new rulers. There is also the farmer's basic will to work his own land. The Russian peasant has always been the weakest link in the Soviet system. From the very beginning, the peasants have resisted efforts to collectivize their farms. Ever since the land was first taken from the peasants in 1929, Russia's bureaucrats have had trouble in producing the crops she needs. Every year, more machinery is used. More virgin land broken to the plow in Central Asia. But the Russians grow little more grain than 20 years ago. It takes five times as many farmers to till and to harvest 1,000 acres in Russia as it does in America. Much of the land is dry and poor in Central Asia. In order to increase food production, the communists have been forced to make a curious concession. Namely, on many collective farms, each household has been given the use of an acre of land where a family can raise fruit and vegetables. They sell them in the open market at a good price, often much higher than the government figure. Near the free market, where goods are expensive, is a government market where they are cheaper but scarce. All stores in the Soviet Union are state-owned. Free enterprise is limited to what a man can do by himself, for the law forbids hiring an employee. The Russian winter, which defeated Napoleon and Hitler, is also very hard on members of a collective farm in white Russia, where for weeks on end, the cold hits 10 and even 20 degrees below zero. In 1929, in protest against collectives, many peasants killed their animals. The Second World War caused the death of millions of cattle. Today, there are no more animals than in 1928. Underneath, the Russian peasant is an individualist. He likes his own land best. For the work they do on the collective farm, they get paid in produce. A peasant woman feeds her own chickens when her work on the collective is done. On the collective farm, everyone's attitude, even the truck drivers, is constantly being checked by the Communist Party cell. But how much satisfaction a man gets from working on a collective farm depends on how this wood will be used. Will it go into a house he will live in or a sled for the use of the big farm? Several miles from each collective farm is a machine tractor station run by the Soviet government. This method gave the central authorities a tight control over every farm. Tractors and combines from such depots were loaned out to nearby collectives. This system, always inefficient, is slowly being abolished. Soon tractors and all farm machinery will be placed permanently upon the farms themselves. Skilled mechanics, like most industrial labor, are given a quota. For producing above their quota, they get bonuses. 
an important incentive in the Soviet system. Wages largely depend on how important the government considers the work. Heavy industry pays the most. Strikes are forbidden, and unions have virtually no power at all. But collective bargaining, restricted to working conditions, goes on in a very limited way. Safety practices, however, are still primitive. Whatever has low priority in Russia, be it personal safety or locomotives, tends to suffer. But Russians make up for this with a kind of Yankee ingenuity. Despite old equipment and a lack of spare parts, the railroads keep up with the nation's tremendous industrial growth. In cities, most families have to live in a single room. A worker spends only about five rubles on rent out of every hundred he earns. But he and his family deeply resent the lack of privacy. Apartment houses are going up, but not fast enough to keep up with the growth of the cities. And housing remains a serious Russian problem. Women are on an equal basis with men in Soviet industry enjoying the same pay and opportunities. Equality extends to the heaviest kind of labor. Stalin's portrait still stands outside the great cotton textile works in Tashkent. Inside, a sign reads, let us mobilize all our forces to carry out the decisions of the 20th Party Congress. After 40 years, such slogans inspire but little. Yet the factory, with 23,000 employees, is as modern as any in the world. Workers make the equivalent of about $10 a week, which seems very little to an American, but very much to people in India, in Pakistan, and the rest of Asia. Cloth is better and more plentiful than it used to be, but it's still expensive and scarce. So are other consumer goods in Moscow stores, the largest of which is GUM, the Government Universal Store. Many people visit GUM as tourists, not as buyers. They haven't the money to buy much, and stocks are limited. A good suit of clothes or a warm winter overcoat costs two months' wages. A small car, about three years' wages for the ordinary worker. The prices in a small dry goods store are the same as in Goom, and so is the shortage. There is much profiteering by people who, through influence, are able to buy what is available and then resell it at a profit. Consumer goods must wait until the government has decided that people can have them. But waiting isn't so hard for people who have always waited. socialist society, say the Soviets, and children are clay in the mold. in the Soviet Union 
is organized and disciplined. Its chief object is not well-rounded citizens, but efficient units in Soviet industrial society. Courses are controlled by the Communist Party for political ends. Almost half of the students learn English so that later they may study journals and textbooks from English-speaking countries. They learn it much better than American children learn Spanish or French. Science and engineering are the most important subjects, while the humanities, the liberal arts, are neglected. Older students know that doing well in calculus now may bring rich rewards later on. At Kiev Polytechnic Institute, almost all students receive a government stipend. It's barely enough to live on. They could earn much more working in a factory. But they are investing in a future in which science can put them in the top income bracket and give them great social prestige. Before entering the university, most of them have had a job for several years. They are exempt from military service. After graduation, they will work on a state project. There is no other. In the library are hundreds of foreign journals, all technical. Advanced Russian students learn more about our science than our students know about theirs. To the men in the Kremlin who see scientific knowledge as the key to world power, such journals are both a boon and a dilemma. For a man who begins by thinking about science may someday end by thinking about freedom. Medical care is supposed to be available to everyone in the Soviet Union, although the facilities are often very limited. In spite of the free treatment offered, many people choose to pay for their own medical care, even at high fees. One interesting aspect of Soviet medicine is that two-thirds of the doctors are women. There is a large stadium in every city where sports events are held. Many young people devote their lives to the goal of world athletic supremacy for the Soviets. Giant pep rallies are designed to reassure the people that someday their privations will end and their cause triumph. Moscow University is the highest center of Russian education. Here there are no SNAP courses. The students are serious and concerned about their studies. They must be, for failure here may well mean a life of poorly paid and unrewarding work. Honor here, however, may mean membership in Russia's newest nobility of physicists and mathematicians. Education in science can have as one of its end results studies in basic research. Soviet scientists, like many others, are working on subjects relating to the structure of the atomic nucleus. Large particle accelerators have been constructed to bombard the nucleus. Some of these research machines like the one in this building, have energies in the range of billions of electron volts. From such basic research can come anything. An atomic icebreaker at the North Pole, or weapons of fantastic horror, 
or a man at the moon. Soviet Russia is very interested in atomic power as a source of electrical energy. Although at present atomic power stations are inefficient, they would be ideal in remote areas, far from normal fuels. This is a small atomic power station near Moscow with an output of 6,000 kilowatts. The Soviets are building another experimental plant in China, an expensive way of giving the Chinese light, but good propaganda for Russia. For the men who control Russian science and industry have but one object, to awe, to frighten, to divide, to conquer. Victory is what the men in the Kremlin want. But against a strong and united West, military victory, although conceivable, would be a catastrophe for those who won, as well as those who lost. So the Kremlin must play a waiting game, seeking to strengthen the confidence of their own people while weakening the alliances of the West. As the Kremlin waits, a group of young Americans sing and dance with Soviet students near Alma-Ata in Russian Central Asia. Soon other such groups, in America as well as in Russia, will be talking together and exchanging their opinions. For now both countries, the Soviet Union and the United States, have agreed to widen their exchange of persons to include music and the arts, agriculture, medicine and science, and even to encourage ordinary travelers. This is no simple cure-all for the world's ills, but it is a step toward world understanding, even among the dark shadows which the spires of the Kremlin have long cast, and still do cast, across Russia and the world.